It was the greatest independent record label in history. This is The Righteous Bo Jambo, and it's time to talk about Atlantic Records. In 1967, one of the Dwayne bands of the early classic rock era, The Birds, released a record called So You Wanna Be a Rock and Roll Star, which describes, amongst other depredations the hip and groovy young rockers would be subjected to, was selling their souls to a company which would on-sell their priceless art as plastic wear. In effect, they complained that the record industry had, finally and actually, become an industry and at the center of the industry as it always had been and would be until the mid 90s when disruptive technologies and failure to understand them finally broke its power was the record label this is where the birds were proven naive since the very first days of recorded music the record industry had very much indeed been an industry Some of the classic canon's most potent iconography is invested in the dynastic powers of these labels, their legendary stables of stars and their ability to shape music as a product in the face of social and market forces that dominated the narrative of the 20th century. Myth and convenience has it that there are two kinds of labels, major and independent arbitrarily divided between those companies that raise capital externally and those that raise it internally. The story also has it that independents work on the fringes of the market, finding new trends and establishing them and that the majors then shape these into a mass market variation upon a prevailing cultural template. Independent labels rose up in the period towards the end of and immediately after the First World War, largely as a response to the jazz boom. The major labels didn't really see indies as competition, but as a resource to be used. Some of the great names were soon recording on these independent labels. King Oliver, Jelly Roll Morton, Blind Lemon Jefferson, they all spent time on Janet. And OK recorded Crazy Blues by Mamie Smith, the first recording written, performed and sung by all black artists. It sold 150,000 copies and led directly to Columbia and Victor, signing Bessie Smith and Ma Rainey, respectively. But disaster awaited not just independent record makers in 1930, but the whole industry fell under threat with the Great Depression. Sales fell from 100 million records in 1930 to a mere 6 million the year after, with prices for records falling from a dollar to as low as 35 cents. The independents started either going to the wall or being bought up by the majors, and the majors in turn were bought up by even larger companies, chiefly the radio networks. Recording of new or niche music's all but disappeared as big band dance music came to an unprecedented level of dominance of the market. It was not until after World War II as America re-emerged into a period of prosperity, advances in communications allowed for cheap, high-quality record making, and the niche music markets expanded wildly that the independents began to surge again, and some of the truly iconic studios opened up in the late 1940s and the early 1950s, along with record labels that helped define the sound of the times. Memphis Recording Services, later Sun, Tamla in Detroit, Ireland in the UK. The most iconic, the most powerful, and the most spectacularly successful of them all was Atlantic Records. And here is where one pragmatic narrative meets the other romantic one. Post-war America is a story of immigration, a new wave of industry, innovation, and for our story, most importantly, aspiration. In a land which was at peace, and philosophically due to an unprecedented belief in its own charter and values, and was seen as a land to outsiders where the dream of freedom was still worth dreaming, and the air of freedom still worth breathing. 
This is the story of two of those immigrants and their immersion in the American dream. It must be said that these two particular immigrants were far from the model of those huddled masses fleeing the tyrannical claw of communism or emerging into a dazzling new world from a bomb-crushed Western Europe. Far, far from it. These were the two pampered sons of the Turkish ambassador to the USA. Their names were Nasui and Ahmet Erdogan. Urbane, romantically-minded Nasui was obsessed with jazz and filled the library in the Turkish embassy with 15,000 records and had, beginning in 1941, been promoting jazz concerts in Washington, D.C. Ahmet, energetic, gregarious and witty, who idolised his big brother, was a student at Georgetown University who also loved jazz, but was equally into blues and pop. When Dad cashed in his chips in 1944, the boys, pressured by their families to return to Turkey, declined to do so. Nazui took a job in California with jazz band records and founded his own label, Crescent, which released some very influential records which helped bring attention back to the New Orleans scene. And Ahmet ostensibly continued his studies but actually played hooky, got a job in a record store and devoted himself to talking to rack jobbers and A&R men to learn how labels worked. In 1946, Ahmet's friend Herb Abramson formed Jubilee Records, but soon sold out his shares to his partner as the Jewish comedy records the label seemed determined to focus on were not to Herb's liking. Herb's cut of the deal became a critical part of Atlantic's startup capital. In March 1947, Ahmet and Herb put together what would be the framework of Atlantic Records. To the team, they added Herb's then wife Miriam, a woman about whom the tales are legion, legendary, and occasionally unbelievable. Suffice to say that she was an extraordinarily vitriolic and tenacious woman who was fiercely loyal to Erdogan. The final player in the dream team was the most unlikely. Arvid's family dentist, Avadi Sabit, stumped up $10,000 in the full knowledge that there'd be no quick return on his investment. Armit and Herb hit the club, signing a motley selection of jazz men and a few gospel acts for their initial roster. By August, the roster was at work laying down sides. In October, the merry band decamped to the then decrepit Jefferson Hotel in Hell's Kitchen after a suite at the Ritz proved far too expensive and incorporated Atlantic Records. There was, however, a major hurdle to be surmounted yet for the fledgling company. Musicians Union had proposed a recording ban for the year of 1948. Ahmet decided to run the band as he had nothing to lose and it was the only way he could compete with the big boys who would have had massive stocks of recordings to release across the band. Besides, if the union gave him any trouble, he could simply ask them to speak to Miriam who no doubt would disabuse them of any notions of interference in no uncertain terms. The first releases came out in late January 1948. From the releases, it becomes quickly apparent that the label had largely forsaken its jazz remit and headed, in general, straight to the then lowest common denominator. Mid-tempo, dance-oriented, small combo, rhythm and blues. Release number one did, however, stay true to the jazz path, with Safrantic from Eddie Safransky. It's a modish West Coast sounding jazz number with a very cool sax solo from the soon to be great Art Pepper and a nice comp on the piano holding it all together. The initial batches were anchored by two of the staples of Atlantic's early releases. Joe Morris, a good trumpeter and a better band leader, and Tiny Grimes, a guitarist who was once of Art Tatum's band, which does give him some considerable pedigree. Morris had the R&B thing down pat with releases like Low Groovin' and Mad Moon, and Grimes had some great greasy sounding stuff with Blue Harlem and that old black magic. That said, Bob Howard's take on Button Up Your Overcoat, full of awful shuck and jive, might just be the worst record Atlantic made of its original hundred. In fact, Atlantic may have in its own way been ultimately responsible for ensuring that black artists no longer had to make records like that through their sponsorship of black artists recording to suit black sensibilities but pitching it to a white audience and Melrose Colbert's Heart and Soul which was released number three is pretty painful. The first sniff of a hit the label got was when Tiny Grimes's Midnight Special made number 12 on the Billboard Race Records chart in October 1948. 
not the well-known and beloved Lead Belly standard midnight special, but it's a pretty strong workout. There's very little jazz left in this, and now it is leading itself towards that kind of driving, riff-propelled, small combo beat music that a certain Jerry Wexler would some years later name Rhythm and Blues. Joe Morris got into the groove on release number 16 with the hard-driving and tricky Applejack. Not a hit, but a personal favourite of the foul quince. But it was release number 23 in March 1949 that was the big click, that was the game changer. Sticks McGee's absolutely outstanding re-recording of Drink and Wine Spodiote. McGee originally recorded it on Harlem Records in 1946 and Ahmet sought to lease the record for Atlantic, but no dice. By late 1948, however, Harlem was out of business and Styx was out of contract, so it was a simple matter getting in the studio with his cousin, the famed bluesman Brownie McGee, to re-record it. Suffice to say, the product of that session is a bumptious, rollicking, rocking and rolling classic. If not the first rock and roll record, then the record after which no objective observer, no matter how stringent their criteria be, could deny that a new form of music had arisen. Atlantic followed up with Frank Cully, who hit the top 10 with his groove and coleslaw, as did Mr. Reliable Joe Morris with a rollicking version of Beans and Cornbread, which Lewis Jordan took to number one at the same time. It was around this time that Columbia made a bid to buy out Atlantic. While the deal looked good on paper, Erdogan rebuffed the giant because they refused to pay artists the same level of royalty that Atlantic paid them, which was a, for the time, very high 3-5%. That high royalty rate, coupled with the scrupulous honesty of management, along with art we pay of specialty records, the executives at Atlantic were some of the few unimpeachably honest bosses in the industry. It was just as well that the corporate raiders were seen off as one of the most remarkable stories in the history of the label was about to unfold. Atlantic was about to find a modicum of financial stability through the medium of its first bona fide superstar, the stunning Ruth Brown. The label went out to sign Brown in late 1948, but on her way to the gig which was to serve as her audition, she was involved in a serious car wreck. Undaunted, Atlantic signed her from a hospital bed and supported her for nine months recuperation. She repaid Atlantic time and again. 22 top 10 R&B hits, five number ones, and their first crossover pop hit with Mama He Treats Your Daughter Mean, which made number 23 on the pop charts. Eventually, Brown became a regular visitor to the pop hit parade. So frequent were her hits and so impressive her sales that Atlantic became known in the trade as the house that Ruth built. Release number 64 saw Atlantic finally claim its first R&B number one. Deservedly, Joe Morris reached the pinnacle with any time, any place, anywhere. The record does, however, curiously feature the nails down a chalkboard vocal stylings of one Laurie Tate. Atlantic got back at number one in 1950 with release number 69, which was its first 45 RPM vinyl single, The Hard Swingin' Teardrops From My Eyes by Miss Ruth Brown. The next major act to record and hit big was The Clothes, who had a number one hit with their first single, the Armit Erdogan penned Don't You Know I Love You, release number 84, which sold over 300,000 copies, and was a historically important record because it broke R&B that little bit further away from its jazz roots by moving to a more rigid, less swinging 2-4 time signature, jazz at the time being almost exclusively in 4-4 four, four or 8-8, eight, eight, and giving it as direct and a hard driving sound. Again on the doo wopish side of things, the Cardinals, with their brilliant lead singer Ernie Warren, debuted with a number 7 hit in Shouldn't I Know, which features some prominent and excellent electric guitar. Rock and roll pioneer Big Joe Turner joined the Atlantic roster in 1951 and kicked off with a couple of big hits. The Erdogan pen Chains of Love and The Chill Is On, releases number 89 and 99 respectively, both of which peaked at number 3. That was a solid start, but Big Joe had history to make in him, and greater triumphs awaited over the next three years. Atlantic reached the 100 release mark in November 1951 fittingly with a Joe Morris release. By that time, they had a stable including its reliable hitmakers in Morris and Joe Turner, 
genuine superstars in brown and clovers and have made its first moves towards the new LP market with 10 inch 78s from Errol Garner and Joe Buskins and its first 12 inch which was a volume of poetry recitations. His early releases were incredibly important records. Given that production budgets were all but non-existent, Atlantic built its studio model around small combos after the style of Lewis Jordan or Nat King Cole, or even the five-piece bebop units that were emerging in New York at the time. There wasn't any money for arrangements either, so the songs were simple, dance-oriented and direct. So as much as Atlantic was envisaged as a jazz label, they were also integral in cutting the strings of jazz and letting its new emerging form, rhythm and blues, find a market and flourish. The future was still uncertain for the scrappy little label from Hell's Kitchen. In the next year or so, Ruth Brown went nationwide and gained a label rival in the mighty Laverne Baker. The legendary Drifters debuted and the great talisman of the label, the fire that burned hottest and brightest of them all, the titanic Ray Charles entered the scene. But that's for another day. Suffice to say, golden years lay before the label. This is the Righteous Bow Jambo. No, didn't like that at all. Didn't like that one at all. It's like I'm going, this is the Righteous Bow Jambo? Is it? Really? How did I end up there? How did any of us end up where we are?